I have to tell you all that this was a stroke of genius on our part because uh, we managed to get Arun Rao very soon after one of the lectures on the Globalization, Gender and Development course, where the work that she does in the real world, you know, outside, uh, the, outside the university, links very much to some of the things that we've been talking about on the course. And it's very much about trying to take these small, large organizations of various kinds, within the UN system, within civil society, and to some extent the corporate sector, trade unions, etc., and get them to reflect on their own practices from a gender diversity equality perspective. So while gender is clearly a very central aspect of her work, they look at uh, broader issues of diversity as well. Uh, Aruna has been in this line of work for around 30 years, right? And, how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, she's probably a little older than she looks. Uh, and uh, she and I go back many, many years. Uh, in fact, she and her husband uh, worked in Bangladesh for a while and knew my mother and my cousin and my aunt and my best friend. <laughs> so there's an, uh, an, a nice long connection. But I've also been following her work over the years. Uh, she's been in many kind of very high profile positions, including being the, was it the president of the board? I can never remember, the director? Well, the president of the board of AWID, which is the Association of Women in Development, which is the biggest network of women's organizations, women's rights organizations in the world, and has amazingly wonderful conferences, so you must try and go to the next one. The AWID conferences to me are a model of inclusiveness. You know, they try to make it possible for all kinds of different groups, men, women, to participate. Um, the last one we went to, I think there are 12 languages being simultaneously translated. Uh, and she's also been president of Civicus, which is, again, an international network of civil society organizations, membership organization, individuals, who are looking at promoting civil society participation in, in governance processes and so on. But for the last 10 or 15 years, she's been working in a kind of virtual organization. She herself is based in Washington, but they have members, uh, you know, uh, other staff members all over the world, called Gender at Work. And out of Aruna's experience, she has published many, many articles, uh, some of which are on the reading list of the Globalization, Gender and Development courses. Uh, but it, it tries to pull together what is this very challenging uh, project, but of course one that we're all committed to, which is how do you get organizations to change their ideology, culture, and practices. So Aruna, over to you, and it is a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so very much. About 40 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm really happy to be here. It's really an honor to be here. Um, you don't know how lucky you are to have Nyla as a professor. I wish I had Nyla as a professor, um, but I certainly draw on Nyla's work and thinking very much and have for many years and continue to do so. So for me, it's a real honor to be here. Um, I, uh, am, I have a technical question. I'm wondering whether we can turn the lights down so that you can see this presentation better. Is it behind? The one, the front one. Is that good? That's, that's Ooh, good. that's very dark. <laughs> then I can't read my notes. Yes, that's, it. that's good? Yeah. yeah, that's good. Okay. So, um, what I'd like to do uh, this afternoon is to tell you a little bit about gender at work um, and the work that we do. And I know that at least some of you um, who are in, in Nyla's course um, have looked at uh, institutions and are studying institutions. Um, and what we do really is, is look at what you've studied theoretically and look at how it actually works in organizations and how do we challenge and change them. Um, so what I'll do is I'll tell you a little bit about gender at work and then give you three examples of how we've actually worked with three different kinds of organizations, okay? And uh, um, I, I look forward to, to your, your questions and your uh, comments. 
Um, so gender at work. As, as Nyla said, we are a, uh, a, a network. We're a virtual network. We are 28 staff and associates in 10 countries. Um, and essentially what we do is we, we work on strengthening uh, organizations to build cultures of equality. So we work, as Nyla said, not only on gender equality, but we have a specific focus on gender equality. But gender equality, as you can imagine, um, intersects with many other kinds of issues of the way power works out in organizations. So we need to, to look at those broader issues as, as well. Um, our, the seeds of this work actually began, um, and Naila didn't mention this, uh, when I, I worked at BRAC in Bangladesh, um, which is when I met Naila's mother. Um, and in BRAC, we, and this was in the early 90s, we had the unusual opportunity of, um, of a, a very broad terms of reference, where we looked at how organizational culture uh, impacted on the way in which programs were designed and ran, um, and um, the way in which uh, the, the, uh, the systems and uh, ways of working if that organization you know, actually played out. So it was a, a way to, um, we, we developed a way for staff in BRAC themselves to, to investigate and address pieces of those problems that they felt that they could address. Um, we then wrote uh, a book uh, called Gender at Work, which was published in 99, um, where we, we had a conference where we brought together people who worked on similar issues but very different kinds of organizations. So we had a team from the body shop. Um, we had a team from uh, the National Land Committee in South Africa. Um, a team from um, CIMIT, which is one of the institutions that are part of the agricultural um, research institutions. The one uh, CIMIT works is in Mexico and it works on um, maize and wheat. So all of these people were looking at similar questions, that is, we're looking at organizational biases, we're looking at institutional biases that got reflected within organizational practices. Um, but doing it in very different ways. So for example, the people at CIMIT were using the work of Peter Senge and using mental models um, to, you know, to sort of hold the mirror back to the organization. In BRAC, we worked in a very different way in that we, we did a very broad needs assessment with the staff of the organization and developed participatory ways that the staff could own the research, the data that they were using, and use that to develop um, problem solving, to do problem solving. So um, essentially, as, as you've gathered by now, we focus on these, what we call deep structures uh, of inequality and as they are manifested in organizations. Um, and Gender at Work does uh, a couple of things. We do consulting work, we do capacity building work, and we also try to uh, reflect on what we are learning from our work and that we build grounded knowledge. Um, now, this is, is probably um, a superfluous slide. Um, Nyla does this much better. But um, essentially, what we do is we understand, we try to understand the difference between institutional uh, rules and organizational practice. Um, institutions, as you know, are those informal uh, and formal rules that that structure, ways of being, relationships, ways of working, that are um, that really are symbolic both of material and um, uh, that are symbolic of power, the way power works, materially as well as in in more invisible ways. Um, they essentially determine who gets what, who does what, and who benefits, and who decides. Um, and institutions are manifest in organizations, in the sense that organizations are, you know, they're microcosms of, of uh, the societies that grow them. So it's, it's not unusual that you have formal organizations that, where there are people who also embody those, those unconscious or conscious biases and make the rules of that organization, and organizations reflecting 
the kinds of values that, um, that the societies in which they grow uh, hold. It's also true that organizations can consciously um, go against those, uh, you know, those rules. So BRAC, for example, um, decided to go against some of those rules in, you know, in various things that they did. Just to give you an example, men and women together lived in a compound together in the area offices, and BRAC has about 450 area offices around the country in Bangladesh. Um, and they lived together and worked together. Now, you know, BRAC was started in 1971. Um, and, you know, when you think about that norm, it challenged the norm that women, you know, in that society cannot live and work with men. So, you know, an organization can, um, can both challenge them, but often uh, organizations have these biases sort of ingrained or hotwired into their, their DNA. And, and often they, these, these biases live under the surface. So generally what you see, you know, the, an organization's annual report won't tell you that they hold certain kinds of institutional biases, right? They won't tell you that power works in a certain kind of way and although there may be structures or committees that are decision-making bodies, that in fact, you know, there's, a, there's an informal network that actually makes decisions. Um, so what you see, it's a little like an iceberg. So what you see on the outside, you know, hides a lot uh, that's on the inside. And the things on the inside that everybody in an organization knows, you know, this is not rocket science. Everybody understands what the deep structure is of an organization when they're in it. But what an outsider doesn't necessarily see are how does power work in this organization to allocate resources, to make decisions, to set priorities um, and you know to to measure results. How does an organization um, believe that they're doing well? Those are the kinds of things that um, you know that that are decided within organizations and not always obvious to outsiders. Um, what is the accountability system in the organization? Really, really, what are people accountable to? I mean, the the work of gender and development is littered with um, policies. I shouldn't say littered, it's, it's uh, populated with um, gender policies that have very good intentions, but often these policies are implemented in, in certain ways which have not often held people in that organization accountable for those kinds of gender equality outcomes. Um, there are cultural norms and behaviors in organizations which are, which are um, you discover them fairly quickly, but uh, you know are not always obvious, um, and can have very important um, impacts on who gets to say what, who gets to speak up, how decisions are made, those kinds of things, as well as defining what is work, um, what is considered valuable work in an organization. You remember, um, uh, you're probably all too young to remember, but Hillary Clinton famously said at the Beijing conference. Um, the United Nations World Conference that was held in Beijing uh, 20 years ago that women's rights are human rights. And if you look actually at the work of Amnesty International, it's taken Amnesty International, um, oh, I guess about 30 years to actually recognize, to actually change its practices um, so that women's rights are considered, are actually part of, you know, it's been expanding the notion of human rights from political and civil rights to looking at economic and social rights. That's been one of the big hurdles, but also there's a convention around that, a UN convention around that. So that's been part of it. But then also looking at women's rights as a legitimate field of work at a legitimate part of you know, uh, human rights practice and therefore um, monitoring has also taken you know, a, a big long time. And it's still very haphazardly done. So defining what is work is also part of it. Um, so, Gender at Work clearly is not the only organization that, that looks at um, how organizations work, uh, how institutional biases work within organizations and the impact they have. Um, they, you've all heard about the implementation gap, you know, uh, sort of the post-Beijing, uh, the post-Beijing 20-year review has talked a lot about the implementation gap. You know, why is it that um, that the uh, Beijing Plan of Action, which was a very comprehensive plan of action, um, has not actually been implemented uh, or has been varyingly be Im uh, implemented in practice. 
Um, what is that gap of implementation? Um, CEDAW as well. CEDAW is, um, I'm, you probably all are familiar with CEDAW convention. It's a UN convention against the elimination of discrimination against women. Um, there are CEDAW reports that are done uh, every year by a group of countries, and there's a shadow report done also. That's also looking at, you know, to what extent is this, this these norms, these standards, these policies that are put in place, to what extent are they implemented? And I know that um, some of you at least have been uh, lo looking at gender mainstreaming. Gender mainstreaming, you know, for its time, was really a radical idea, you know? It was really, it was, it said that for, it, it looked at this question of how formal organizations actually implement gender policies. And it said that every action Every, every analysis, every plan has to actually look at gender impacts, has to look at gender differentiated uh, um, participation, has to look at gender differentiated data and all of that, has to design programs that's, that are that addressing that, addressing those gaps, and then has to actually monitor whether or not there are gender differentiated you know, benefits. So are women in fact benefiting vis-a-vis -vis men? Um, so it was a radical idea, but clearly um, there's been, as you know, um, organizations have implemented that kind of um, policy in, in, uh, in, in, in different ways. And so, you know, not all of the, the, the expected outcomes from that have in fact materialized. I mean, that's being kind. Um, there have been a number of radical, fairly more radical critiques of gender mainstreaming, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and certainly social movements and women's movements um, in, in different places have been a, um, a part of social change, but it's also, um, uh, and they're also looking at accountability. So democracy movements, anti-corruption movements, environmental movements are also sort of that, you know, a, a friend of mine from the Philippines uh, who used to head the, um, the work in the Philippines, the National Commission once said, in order to bake that cake, you have to have the fire at the top and the fire from the bottom, you know? Um, so the fire from the bottom is, is as important as the fire from the top. And I would add that one also has to look at the, the, the in-between, you know? And that's kind of where gender at work um, uh, focuses itself. So if you look at, um, I know you, you can't read this very well, but I'll give you a few examples. Um, if you look at the, the kind of gains that have been made, you know, in the last, say, 20 years or 30 years, and those of you who you know been looking at this, the literature on this, the WDR, for example, the World Development Report last year, um, looked at the kinds of gains that, that women have made over the the, uh, the last 20, 30 years, and certainly there have been a lot of gains, right? Um, and I'm sure you know um, the fact that all of you are here actually uh, is is a gain. I mean, the access to higher education, for example, is a huge gain. Um, uh, that you know women are. Um, the, the levels uh, or the, the number of women actually entering tertiary in institutions uh, is, it has risen, um, as has women's or girls' um, enrollment at the primary and secondary level. Um, labor force participation, if you look at, you know, how the Millennium, millennium Development Goals, the one on gender equality, there are four indicators. So if you look at those, certainly there's been gains in a number of them, although the one on um, the representative uh, women's um, representation in decision-making bodies in parliaments has not, you know, gained that much except for a few countries. Um, so there have been a number of gains, but, you know, there, there have been the, the, the kinds of things that gender at work works on are these sort of sticky issues, right? And the sticky issues show up in, in different ways. So, <clears throat> for example, um, violence against women, that's a huge thing right now. I mean, you're seeing you're seeing a lot more uh, attention to um, not necessarily addressing, to some extent addressing violence against women, but it's much more of an issue in the public sphere, um, violence against women. And there's, uh, there's a, a trust fund, a United Nations trust fund, that um, specifically focuses on violence against women, so it gives you know, funding to organizations to deal with that. Um, whether there's been an increase or decrease in violence against women is, I think, I mean, the, the data shows that there's been an increase, and it's all over the place, uh, and it's and it's regardless of um, uh, income class, and it's and it's and it's regardless of 
uh, you know, sort of um, low-income countries versus high-income countries. So countries like, whether you, if you look at Norway and India, for example, um, you know, Norway also, you would never expect, but Norway also has fairly high levels of violence against women um, that you would never, you know, you, you would imagine that since Norway is one of those countries that everybody says they always want to go and live there, or at least there's that index that says, you know, everybody's happy in Norway. But certainly this, this issue, violence against women, is, is prevalent there and is, is a, a problem in Norway as much as it is. I mean, India has a huge population and so, and there have been these recent cases, but that's a kind of issue that, that is one of those sticky issues which, um, have, have been very difficult to change, have been very difficult to, to um, actually make progress on. Agriculture is another one where um, I've worked a lot with on, on agricultural issues in the past couple of years. And, you know, the, the data shows that um, subsistence farmers, for example, and we've known this forever, um, <laughs> subsistence farmers in, in sub-Saharan Africa produce most of the food in Africa, right? This is not new. Um, but and although FAO will dispute this, there's still that, you know, it's, you know, the, the data says that it's about women may not own only 1% of the land, which was that, that famous quote, but they certainly own very little of the land. Um, and, and, and that has very important implications because without land ownership, you cannot access certain kinds of resources and inputs that you need because land is often seen, continues to be seen as collateral for, say, getting credit or for, um, for agricultural extension workers to actually focus on you because you actually have land. Um, so there are these kinds of sticky issues which, um, which are, are very difficult to change. Um, change, of course, happens in a variety of ways, but the way in which we look at it is to focus in on, on organizations. Now, what this is is, um, it's called the Gender at Work Framework. Um, it's an analytical framework that's built on um, the integral framework of Ken Wilber. Um, and uh, what it does is, is look at the question of what are we trying to change? Right? There are two axes in this framework. The vertical axis goes from individual to systemic. The horizontal axis goes from informal to formal. Um, and so on the right-hand side of the framework is what is public, what is, you know, what, what you see above that, the waterline, what is uh, measurable, right? So at the individual level, it has to do with access to resources like healthcare, like education, um, like training uh, facilities, like credit, at the, at the systemic level, it has to do with things like laws, policies, um, uh, accountability uh, mechanisms. On the, on the, inf on the uh, left side of the framework is the informal. So at the individual level, it has to do with uh, individual consciousness. Um, your understanding of uh, change, of uh, your own set of values, um, and it's and at the at the at the lower left-hand quadrant, which is you know where a lot of what we do focuses on, has to do with cultural norms, values, behaviors, ways of working um, that uh, you know form this bundle of kind of unquestioned. Uh, uh, value sets, what we call culture. Right? So this kind of um, framework, when we, we develop this, uh, to be able to look both at what is it we're trying to change in a community or a, or a place that we're working with, but also to look at what are we trying to change in organizations. Right? Um, it's a framework that allows you to do number of things. It allows you, for example, um, to, to, to develop or articulate a theory of change. So suppose um, your intention is to, um, to increase women's access to um, reproductive, actually, let me change that, because it's an interesting example. 
if you're, uh, the example I'm going to use is um, to change men's access to paternity leave in Brazil. I was just talking to uh, a friend of mine, Gary Barker, who heads Promundo, um, Brazil, and now he's back in the US. And they're an organization that works with men and boys to uh, challenge gender stereotypes uh, and, and institutional rules, but working, working with men and boys um, for gender equality. So um, working in Brazil, uh, they, one of the things that they were trying to do um, when they were working broadly in the health sector was to increase um, men's paternity leave. So women, had, women in Brazil actually have a very generous um, maternity leave, but men have only five days of paternity leave. Um, and so the idea was uh, there was a, they, they mobilized to, with a number of organizations to try to increase the level, uh, increase the number of um, uh, paternity leave, increase paternity leave for men. <clears throat> and then um, the, the women's organizations um, said, hey, wait, 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 wait a minute. Um, our data shows that when men are in the house, women's workload actually increases. So if men have more paternity leave and they're in the house more, the unintended effect is that women's work burden is going to go up. So, so it's like, you know, it, so if you focus only on paternity leave and you don't understand, you know, the sort of the dynamics, the cultural dynamics that are happening at the household level in that case, right, then your paternity leave will have unintended negative impacts, right? That's an example. Could also be that, um, so another example is that if you are interested in, um, so I was in Mozambique some years ago um, doing an evaluation and they, uh, Mozambique has invested a lot in, um, in healthcare and they have primary healthcare centers in a number of, you know, places that, that are, say, within 10 kilometers from, um, from communities, from villages. And they're shiny, new, nice healthcare centers. Um, and so what the state there has done has provided a resource, hmm? the healthcare center, which one wants, right? Um, but if, you, if the state and the state doesn't look at, or if it doesn't find ways to look at, what is it that is, what are the, the facilitators at the barriers that will allow women to access the resource, right? Institutional factors mediate our ability to access a resource that's out there. Just because it's there, it doesn't mean we can all use it. Yeah? You and I may be able to use it, but, but if, you're, if women's health is not considered, is sort of of the, the household's priority list, is not a priority, as it is in many cases. Um, if it requires transportation on a bus to go those 10 kilometers and you don't have the money for that transportation, um, then even though you, a resource has been made available, uh, women are not going to be able to use it. So it enables you to look at, you know, what is it that I'm trying to achieve and what am I, how do I think I'm going to achieve that? and then question your assumptions about that theory of change. Um, the same framework can be looked, you can use it to look at organizations. So you can look at men and women's consciousness, skills within an organization and capacities. You can look at how an organization uh, actually allocates resources. So you may have a policy in place, but you may have like the SDC, the Swiss Development Corporation in, in Switzerland, has one and a half people to work on gender equality within the whole organization. So that will obviously impact on how much, uh, you know, how much, uh, can I, how much expertise and capacity there is to actually support the organization to do that work. Right? Um, you can look at policies and procedures and accountability systems very importantly. Um, and you can look at organizational culture. So what I want to do is, how am I doing on time? You've got time. I've got time, good. So, okay, so what I want to do is um, 
is give you three examples, share three examples with you of, um, of how we've worked with these kinds of issues. The first example is um, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme in India. Um, for any of you who don't know about it, it is a, um, it's a, it's a, it's quite a, the, the act is quite a landmark act in that it guaranteed the right to work. And India is the only country in the world which has that guarantee. Um, <clears throat> it was originally meant to provide employment during the lean agricultural season, but right now it, it works all year round. So it means that people in rural areas, um, uh, you know, uh, laborers, uh, small farmers, who don't have who don't have employment um, can demand employment <clears throat> from the local government, and the local government has to provide that employment. And you can demand up to 100 days of work. Okay, it's all kind of uh, uh, heavy, uh, fairly you know difficult earth building work. So it's like you know uh, digging canals, um, uh, you know building culverts, uh, digging ponds, uh, that kind of work. So it's, it's hard work. Um, but the program uh, also has a 30% reservation for women. It um, provides for, it, there's actually provision for an, an unemployment claim. And that has been, uh, that has actually been, uh, there's a group that I know um, that has tried to claim that and got beaten down. So it, it doesn't work in practice, but the policy says there is that provision, that if you, if you demand work in time, you follow all those procedures, you're not given work, you have the right to unemployment. It doesn't actually work in practice. Um, and the work sites have to have certain facilities. So for example, they have to have water, they have to have drinking water. They're supposed to have a shelter, <clears throat> so that you know, in the hot sun you can sort of go in and just rest they're actually also supposed to have childcare facilities. Um, we worked with the, uh, the, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme in, in a small number of districts in Uttar Pradesh, which is the largest state in India, uh, where the levels of women's participation were quite low. So in, in Kerala and Andhra, for example, uh, two other states, the participation level is fairly high, about 60%, but in in Uttar Pradesh, it's about 20% uh, for women, and our focus was to work was to not only in to work with local organisations, not only to increase women's participation, but also Dalit women's participation. Dalit women, for those who of you who don't know, are sort of the um, they're the group that um, that that Gandhiji called the the Harijans, you know, the children of God, the untouchables, quote unquote, in the Indian caste system. They're actually outside the Indian caste system. Um, so our intention was to, to increase their participation, and we worked with four organizations uh, to, to implement four different kinds of innovations. In one site, it was to have an all-women's work site. In one site, it was to train semi-literate women, many of whom were Dalit women, um, to be to take on the job of supervisors. Now, there's a hierarchy of workers in any of these sites. The, there's a the manual work that's being done. There's the supervisors who then measure the uh, work that's done, the sort of the, the earth that's moved, and your wages are dependent on the amount of work you've done. So we trained um, the semi-literate women, many of whom were Dalit women, to actually uh, to, to do this measurement, it's called technical work, um, which the, the program has felt that, although not overtly, but works on the assumption that illiterate Dalit women, illiterate women, or semi-literate women, cannot do this work. Okay? Um, another uh, innovation was to um, work with the local panchayats, the local governance bodies in India, actually manage the money for this program. So even though it's a, it's a national program that has a state bureaucracy, the money is actually challenged through these local governance bodies, so to work with them. Um, so the ways in which we worked with them 
are important. So, for example, in the experiment to try to uh, to to train uh, semi-literate Dalit women to do this kind of work, it was challenging both for the community organizations we were working with, because they also hold these same kinds of assumptions, even though they are about, they're working for poor people to participate in this program. Um, it was challenging the no this notion, which is a gender biased value, right, of who can do what kinds of work. It's challenging that notion, and by showing that it can be done, by developing a program, a training program, where they're actually uh, doing this work, we're learning about how to do it, and showing the, the system, the people in that system, that this can be done. So there are multiple ways at which we worked in, that, in, in, in this program. So you're, you're working with, we worked with a set of local organizations, so there's part of it was kind of conscientization of those local organizations to understand that, ah, this is a possibility. And then there's also the, a, a kind of a process that happens where women in those organizations you know, become, become uh, you know, more confident of their abilities watching what the women in the villages are doing. So, so it has a, a double effect. But it's working you know, with those local, local organizations, challenging this kind of a norm, and then working with the system, politically with the system, both at the national and local level and state level. Um, and the women in the different sites actually formed a union, a workers' union, and so led advocacy efforts which would kind of bolster um, you know, the, the gains that they were trying to, uh, that they have made in their context, but were trying to get the system to adopt. And one of the things that happened was um, that at the end of uh, these two, the two and a half years, although we continued working with, with these organizations, was that there was a seminar held in the state capital and the Minister for Rural Development, that means the Central Minister for Rural Development, um, was invited to come uh, there and, and the participants in this process, as well as other um, activists in this field, uh, you know, presented all of this information, presented these results, and the results were that there was an increase in women's participation throughout the sites. Um, there, there was a, um, there was, you know, there were these, these examples of innovation to, to uh, show, and the minister actually made a policy, uh, they, the, they adopted a policy recommendation uh, for the entire program, reserving 50% of those supervisory posts for women. So now throughout India, they, there is that, that. So you see, the, how, you know, how can this be mapped on the gender at work framework? You start, with, you start over here with formal rules and policies because the act, the Manrega Act enabled this kind of provision to be put in place. <clears throat> And then you move from there towards uh, consciousness and capabilities because many of the, the women, not only Dalit women, weren't really aware that there was this program, that they had these rights, you know, that they had the right to demand this kind of employment, that there was this quota for women, that the work site had to provide drinking water. One of the innovations I also want to tell you about, uh, uh, about the drinking water is that you know, the, the Indian caste system is such that you, you don't accept water from uh, a, a, a Dalit person. It's considered, uh, it's considered polluted. So one of the things that happened uh, was that the, in these sites, uh, we, we put Dalit women in charge of distributing the water, so serving the water to all the workers. So, you know, you, um, so by, looking at, a, at an institutional or, or, or social norm and then just finding a way to challenge that, you know, in a context where you've built a sense of solidarity, belonging, uh, a, a process which Gender at Work uses called gender action learning, which is a process of reflection, learning with peer groups, 
um, it, it enables people to be open to possibilities that they might not otherwise be open to. So, so building that, that capability and that consciousness, and then actually implementing those innovations by which they could actually, uh, women got more jobs. So more women got those job cards which were necessary to, to work in those sites and establish bank accounts which you know, the, the payment is made into their bank accounts. So they had those bank accounts and they had those jobs. And that then, um, these aren't, you know, these, these, these are, uh, it's clearly a small, small area of work, so we haven't changed the entire public consciousness of Uttar Pradesh or India, but still. Um, it does challenge certain kinds of cultural norms and values, right, in the way we worked. Um, and I, I mentioned to you some of these results. Um, so yeah. About oh dear. Can okay. Two more yeah, I do. <laughs> um, I'll try to be faster on the second two. Now, the second example I wanted to share with you is uh, very different. That the first one was a program covering all of India. This is a very small, women-led farm workers union in South Africa. It's called Sikula Sonke. Um, some of you might have heard of it. It's in the Western Cape. Um, it's an area of South Africa with uh, the biggest concentration of farm workers. Many of these farm workers worked um, on, uh, many of these farm workers in that area are, are um, the, they grow uh, grapes for wine. It's a wine growing, it's a wine producing region of South Africa. And there was, in fact, um, a system which has now been abolished, but only recently been abolished, called the DOP system of paying people, paying laborers with wine, which has led, which has, still has its effects today with high levels of alcoholism, high levels of domestic violence. Um, there's a distinct uh, division of labor. Women, uh, men are considered the, the workers, the primary workers. Women are considered supplementary workers, so they're casual, uh, sort of uh, tra considered transient workers. And I mean, if any of you know uh, how, you know, the, the work of trade unions, um, it's much easier to organize a trade union when everybody is in one place. So if you look at, say, South Africa, huge numbers of, I think it's something like um, 80 or 90% of, of mine workers are unionized. I'm looking for my figures here. Yeah? Um, but only about 5 to 7% of agricultural workers are unionized. They're dispersed. It's very difficult to unionize agricultural workers. Um, so, so it's so it's it's quite a it's quite a uh, a, a challenge that Sikula Sonke has taken on. Um, it registered fairly recently, only in, in 20, 2004. It has a, not a very large membership at the moment. Um, about 5,000 women who come from 120 farms. Um, their their intention is to build a democratic union, okay? In a context where models of power and decision making are entirely hierarchical. I mean, if you can imagine what the relationships are like between, have been and continue to be, between poor, semi-literate, uh, black farm workers and and, and the, the farm owners, right? What it has developed, how it has developed under apartheid and continues to, you know, have those same kinds of norms, even though, you know, the, 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 the national um, landscape has changed. Some of these linger on. So if you can, you know, the, the model of power and decision making is one that is very repressive, very domineering, uh, and, and it's not only vis-a-vis -vis the farm worker and the farm, uh, and the farm owner, but also within households between um, men and women has also, is, is a, a very hierarchical kind of um, 
relationship which is very much um, tinged with violence. So this union um, wanted to build a collective leadership and wanted to build gender equality norms in the, in the, in the union. Um, so part of that meant challenging the way these individual women in the union and the sort of the leadership, because you have, you know, the union has a structure. There's a, there's a, a central structure and there are branch structures, right? Executive bodies. So to build that second tier of leadership and build that leadership in a way that doesn't replicate those same models of hierarchy and abuse. Mm -hmm. um, to enable women, but partly it's also enabling women to believe that they can be leaders, to believe that they can do this work, they can take decisions. Um, and interlaid with this are, you know, the, the, the line between public and private are, it, it's somewhat a line drawn in the sand, you know. It, these, these workers, uh, the, the issues that are happening in the home, the alcoholism, the violence, they're bleeding into the organization and, in, and how people and those relationships in the organization. You know, they're not, they're not isolated spaces. They affect each other. So, um, you know, the issue of, of women drinking was an issue that, it, that became an issue for the, the union because one of the leaders, you know, was, was adopting this, was, was drinking, and the union had rules about no alcohol, about no drinking, about, you know, not, not drinking. So it becomes a sort of something that gets challenged both at a public and a private sphere. So you can imagine the kind of issues and, and, and conflicts that they were, they were dealing with. So the questions that they were asking was, how do you create a truly member-controlled organization with gender equal norms? How do you build leadership of women at the farm level? How do you deepen democratic practices in the union? How do you make that member driven? And how do you grapple with, you know, when we think about power, we think about it sort of power writ big, but how do you grapple with the everyday practice, every day, the relationships, the ways in which you talk to each other, the ways in which you hold each other accountable or not? Those, those are also, those are the everyday practices of power. And when you add them up, you know, they become the sort of the ways in which power is understood and, and, and the ways in which power works in that system, that setting. So it's challenging power, not at the, that level, but challenging it at the, at the level of everyday practice. Um, so again, with Sikula Sonke, they believe very strongly that you have to start with consciousness. You have to work with women in the union for them to understand that they can be leaders. You have to work with them to build a sense of leadership that is different from, an understanding of leadership that is different from what they're used to. And then you have to make leadership opportunities available, otherwise it's self-defeating, right? So leadership opportunities have to be available, so people actually have to practice it, and by practicing it, the contradictions that, 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 that are relevant, that show you, you know, where this clash comes between consciousness, understanding, and actually the way things work when the rubber hits the road, come out. So that's when you have a reflection on what are those contradictions? What is that telling us about what we understand? And how is that impacting on our project to build gender equality norms in the organization? So it's you know, that everyday practice of of working to build a democratic union that then helps to, to shape you know, a new culture in the organization. Um, again, with Sikula Sonke, we worked in a gender action learning process 
One of the things that we also do in South Africa, which we haven't done in other places, is um, to use something called um, capacitor kinds of exercises. They are exercises that help build energy and uh, work more with you know, mind, body, spirit. Um, and the reason why they're very important, actually capacitor was something that was developed in um, Nicaragua. Uh, and it, and it, it, these are practices that work with people who are very traumatized or brutalized um, through war and, and you know, genocide and, and things like that. And um, when you're working with people who are not like us, who don't have the kinds of, you know, um, don't come into a room and are able to then, you know, make decisions about something. Um, although all of us carry, you know, some kind of, um, but, but when you're working with these, with, with these kinds of farm workers who sort of daily live their lives, who daily are, 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 are pushed and pulled and uh, live very difficult lives. This is a country with one of the highest levels of violence against women in the world. It's a country where HIV and AIDS has ravaged um, the population, you know, where talk to friends and every other day they're going to funerals. Um, and, and, all, and that context of you know, being a farm worker is that people don't have that energy uh, or, you know, or that spirit that comes from within them to be able to actually work in an organization. So part of what we have done there is, is work with capacitor or integrate capacitor kinds of exercises into the gender action learning process that we've worked with. And another thing that we've done there is also is to um, hold writing workshops which enable people to, participants to deepen their reflection around these practices and contradictions. Um, and also, of course, it has the, the added advantage of, of making that writing available in a public domain, um, which is available on the, the Gendered Work website. So one of the things that um, is on the Gendered Work website is it's a piece that we've actually done for um, the Solidarity Center, which is a support center for the AFL-CIO in, in the United States. Um, and, it, and it looks at um, uh, gender action learning processes that we've used in with five uh, different unions in South Africa. And you can download that um, free of charge from the Gender at Work website. But there's certainly this, Sikula Sonke has had a number of important results. So clearly at the personal level, and I've talked about those, um, the there have also been very concrete results uh, in terms of <clears throat> improvements in people's lives. So the relationship between um, the, the workers and the, the, the farm owners has improved. Um, the people are sort of able to speak up about important practical, we may think they're small, but important needs. So for example, um, in the farm workers' houses to actually have the, the right to and the resources to build a ramp for wheelchairs to go up to the houses. Uh, you know, uh, the farm, farm owners um, agreeing to that. To have the right for toilets in the vineyards um, and in some areas to have electricity. <clears throat> so these are the kinds of gains that have, you know, concrete gains that have resulted in terms of slight improvements in terms of people's lives. Um, and there's also been, so there's been sort of a, a, a personal level of, you know, I, 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 I'm stronger, I can fight my own bottle, battles, my own battles, but there's also been mm -hmm. a I sense of... Just to leave some time for discussion. Oh gosh, yes. So also the sense of, um, you know, addressing uh, issues of, of homophobia, for example. Um, of addressing issues of uh, HIV and AIDS and tackling those. Um, so this one, <clears throat> this, these are pictures from a publication again on the Gender at Work website called Writings from the Inside, and you can also, they are written by these workers. The third example, and I'll go through this very quickly, is um, FAO. It's the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Um, <clears throat> FAO has, uh, as of last year, has a new gender policy. Um, FAO is a very large bureaucracy, and the way in which you work with very large bureaucracies 
is obviously different from the way in which you, you can work with, with smaller organizations that invite you, you know, to come in and work with them. Um, <clears throat> so with, with a large organization like FAO, um, the question was really, even though that there's, there is overwhelming evidence of why an organization like that, and not only that organization, many others, need to support women farmers, right? The, the SOFA report, for example, last year, it's actually 2012, it's the state of the world's uh, state, SOFA, as state of the, sorry, state of the food, food and agriculture, state of the world's food and agriculture, was on women in agriculture. So there's tons of evidence there. There's tons of evidence there has been on the importance of supporting women in agriculture. <clears throat> so the question really was why global institutions can't get it right. And I, I wrote a chapter in this book that, that uh, Wendy Harcourt um, did on, on that very subject. Um, but the kinds of things that you, you, know, you have to pay attention to in a large organization um, are, are not dissimilar, but they are, they are in, in some respects different from the kinds of things you can pay attention to in small organizations. Just a, it's a much larger scale. So um, I show you this example because the, you know, to, to shift a focus of a large organization like this, um, and the tendency of many organizations has been to focus on that, you know, that right-hand side, the formal side of the equation, what they can measure, right? What you can see and what you can measure means that most organizations have not taken on the responsibility of um, looking at their work in relation to producing outcomes or results. They tend to look at their work in relation to the inputs they provide. So most large organizations will say, we do X number of trainings, we hold X number of workshops, we produce X number of publications. And you know, this isn't just large organizations like FAO. I looked at um, the, the trust fund on, um, the UN trust fund on gender, on addressing violence against women. I looked at their grants, uh, did a sort of a quick and dirty analysis. Most of the interventions they supported focused on the right hand side, right? So it was training and capacity building, um, policies, you know, uh, that, that kind of stuff, which is related to, but does not necessarily mean your focus that you're, you're achieving something. What you're achieving is your, your training people. How they use that training is, is a totally different question. So, so FAO's previous policies, and actually if you look at many of the policies of these organizations, <clears throat> they look at the kinds of inputs they can provide to member countries in XYZ area. Right? Um, now, one of the important things they provide are, no are norms and standards. That's a very important thing and that actually the UN system as a whole provides. Uh, but when you start looking at the technical agencies, um, they, they tend to look at, at, at inputs. So this whole business, and, and this is a larger movement, the larger movement of thinking about outcomes. And you've probably heard of outcome mapping um, that, that, you know, that tries to get people to focus on not their, their, not attributing a change to what they do or don't do, but how is it that they contribute to that change, right? So this is an effort. If you look at these objectives, it doesn't, it says women participate equally with men as decision makers in rural institutions in shaping laws, policies, and programs. It doesn't say training women to become leaders in blah, blah, blah. It's a very important distinction. It says women and men have equal access to and control over decent employment income, etc. So it, it forces the organization. That means the organization has to gear its systems and its work, and particularly its accountability and decision making, to looking at how is it they are contributing to a broader goal of uh, these kinds of outcomes. 
Um, I just wanted to point out another thing that Rosalind Iben, um, you may know her name, has just published this book called Feminist Activism in Large Bureaucracy. So there's a whole, you know, there's a thinking about how Femocrats, as Gita Sen called them years ago, <clears throat> you know, feminist activism and political strategies work in large organizations. That's obviously a complementary, complementary area. There are a number of questions and challenges uh, for us, um, and I'm sure they are for you. Um, I wanted to also point you to this. I'm not going to go into those in detail, but I also wanted to point you to this um, paper that we did on. Uh, that Joanne Sandler and I did on, you know, um, gender and development has mm -hmm. done a, a book, uh, a journal on uh, beyond gender mainstreaming. And we wrote one um, that addresses a number of these challenges, which you, if you have the time and interest, you can, uh, you can download also from the Gender at Work website. So I'm going to stop there and thank you very much for listening patiently to me. Um, thanks very much, Aruna. I think uh, it was a very lovely extension to our lecture. Uh, and it's, I, you know, I think for me it was particularly useful in highlighting the kinds of things you have to think about when you move from the theory to the practice. Um, and I think, you know, most of us are not going to end up as world leaders, I don't think, maybe one or two, yeah, but most of us are probably not. So most of us are going to be involved in trying to bring about change through precisely these small incremental ways. And yet I think these small incremental ways add up to something quite important. Because if you, as you were talking, I was thinking certain phrases. One is, they've been about making the impossible possible. A Dalit woman, you know, giving water to women from other castes. This would have been impossible some time ago. Making the unthinkable thinkable. You know, we didn't dream that we were able to do this, become leaders as uh, colored South African women. And yes, we can. And also moving against the grain. It's always about going in against the grain of culture, which means going against the grain of things that we take for granted, we don't question, etc. So this is really about bringing to the forefront of people's consciousness the things that they take for granted. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of other points. I've got loads of little notes that I've taken. But one was about the paternity leave. And I think one of the things that struck me uh, as you were talking is, um, you know, any formal action is embedded in a whole set of practices. So to try to change one bit of that formal action without thinking through everything that, that surrounds it you end up with these unintended consequences. So for instance, there's been a lot of backlash against credit. But you know, just to give people microcredit, women microcredit, on its own is not going to change anything. Because the markets that they work in, the, the, the self the management skills. So we have in South Asia a model called credit, which is just credit, credit plus, which is credit and training and business management, you know, all those skills, and credit plus plus. And plus plus is about consciousness and capabilities. How can you, so many women in the world today are self-employed, but how can you use this credit in a way to make that self-employment much more viable and so on? So your example of giving, you know, the focus on paternity leave was very much an example of that. It also reminded me of a joke in Sweden that when uh, Swedish men were given, first given paternity leave, the uh, authorities, the government found out that a lot of the paternity leave was being taken during the elk hunting season. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they changed the rules. And so you had to take it, your paternity leave within you know, a certain period of your child being born or you forfeited it. <laughs> anyway, so I'd like to throw that open now to any questions. I think uh, it's a good opportunity for you to um, you know, get certain uh, your clarifications about these uh, these matters. So the floor is open. Yeah. Uh, my question is kind of related to paternity leave, particularly the example you gave about Brazil. Um, I was just wondering is what influence do you think um, or sort of like direct influence, how do you think organization they organizations themselves or corporations, what actions can they take to perhaps change that 
that um, <coughs> women having to take up more work in the home or they better opportunity to leave work. It's like that double burden. Like, what can the corporations do to influence micro relationships like that in the private sphere? And have you perhaps seen examples of that? Okay, there was someone here with that. Yeah. I don't know her work and I don't know what you mean by exactly what you mean by subjectivities or exactly how the Safe Motherhood Initiative was implemented there. So you can say just a little bit more about that. Well, yeah, um, it seems like there was already a very uh, a reasonably good health system there uh, and a family, a, re a family structure where uh, pregnancy related um, health problems would be uh, taken care of. As, uh, as a family, so it would be a family decision and not a woman's decision. And obviously that's very complicated and that's very problematic, but in terms of uh, the maternal, once the, the government implemented a policy where women would, for example, not be able to uh, take their families on board or be, they would be interned, but they wouldn't be able to have someone by their sides, then they created this whole clash within their families. Yeah. And some people would separated. Um, there was this case of a woman who actually died of um, uh, during her birth because her husband prohibited her from going to the health center. Mm. So this whole clash, um, it was, it's quite a movie book because it's sort mm. of a, have a bit of an ethnography. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have that. So actually that, it's a very good example of how a government policy has ignored the ways in which families, you know, the, the sort of social norm within households, the ways in which families work. I mean, what is important for that family in terms of if a, if a, if a member of that family needs to accompany, they want to, you know, make that a family decision and need to be there. You know, if that policy then doesn't take that into account, which sounds, sounds like is the case, then it becomes something that that family no longer has control over and doesn't agree with. And the consequence or the unfortunate consequence is that, that you know, the, there are fewer women actually using a service which is the government has provided in good faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's, have a, it, it's backfired. Mm -hmm. It's backfired because they haven't really looked at this kind of thing. Mm 
So it's a very good illustration, really. Of, and I wanted to uh, yeah, thank Naila for pointing out that, in fact, what's really important about this is how things are related. You know, change has to happen in all areas for that change to be sustainable. Change that happens only in one area may be useful, but to Maybe a limited extent. Detrimental. Yeah, and in this case, it's detrimental. And there were those two other questions. <clears throat> yeah, and so the, um, in terms of media, um, so I'm going backwards on the questions. Um, the media, I agree with you entirely that uh, media is, is extremely important and, um, and seems to be one of the great strongholds of patriarchy, I have to say. Um, you know, whether you, you look at Bollywood actresses or Hollywood actresses, you know, this, there's this actress who has a, uh, um, who was the one in the Thelma and Louise, the... Susan Sarandon. No, the other one. Gina, Gina Davis actually works on the issue of gender stereotyping in, in the film industry in the United States. Um, and it is so hugely important, I, and I think one of the, the drawbacks or deficiencies of many of us who work in this field is that we we haven't used communications and media uh, and reached out to them as, as much as we perhaps should. And, and that's probably as, you know, the ways in which we understand how we need to allocate resources, but also our you know, inability. You know, we don't really know that, that world so much, although <clears throat> now... Like the generational thing. I think it's a generational <laughs> thing too. Because now, you know, I, I was just in a meeting yesterday in Amsterdam and, and talking to UK Feminista and, you know, all these organizations. And, you know, they're, they're, there's, it's just a much more digitized world and a much more media-savvy world. And people are not, young people like you are not scared of media. You're not scared of, you know, Twitter. And I mean, some guy told me it's this consulting firm told me that they have to work on my Twitter strategy, and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <clears throat> but, um, um, but they certainly have been uh, interesting uh, examples of that. There's an organization in Croatia called Babe. Um, you should look at their website. They have used, uh, they have used public spaces to ask questions like bus stands and things like that, or the public, like a town square, and put up something provocative, something that will get people to talk or question, uh, you know, gender biases. So certainly there have been a number of, of different um, interventions that try to do that. I don't work in media, and so, and I haven't had that sort of um, background of, or really experience, so I'm, I, I can't really comment more on that, but um, I'm glad you're working on it. Um, look forward to hearing more from you. Um, the, large, the last question on, on what can corporations do, if I understand you correctly, um, your focus was on corporations. Yeah, so I guess um, it was just the influence either directly or in, indirectly that um, through changing their norms in the workplace, that change of norms, how can that then translate private sphere of the household. And I guess I was thinking, maybe the last question was we had that the public mentioning by Nancy Fulbright who was talking about implementing a wage and a work in the household. Um, so, uh, yeah, and the work that women do as a majority. So how, how perhaps could that, could that unequal, um, the unequal amount of work done by men and women and the double burden perhaps of women I think that has been one of the, the hardest to change. I mean, I remember as, uh, this, my board chair, Srilata Bhatliwala, saying to me, if I were the Secretary General of the United Nations, I would still have to come home and make dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I, I mean, I think, I think that's changing again also. That, you know, um, when you talk about social norms, um, partly it is generational, you know. Partly, I mean, some things just take time. You know, as people say, say to me, I mean, patriarchy has history of what? How many years? Two millennium. Two millennium. So, you know, <laughs> give us a chance, okay? We're working on it. 
call me back next week, you know? Um, I think the, the public-private divide, um, the, you know, the sort of the reproductive-productive divide is, is fundamental, it's a fundamental issue, it's a bedrock issue for patriarchy and for gender equality. And, um, and I think changing very, very slowly. So, you know, so in Bangladesh, for example, when we were working in BRAC, um, and we worked throughout the country, you know, uh, we had trained, we had a group of 50 barefoot, barefoot activists all over the country, working in area offices all over the country. And they would carry out this long, you know, this intensive process of gender action learning. People were talking about how to change power, how to change access to information, how do you change, you know, the way men and women relate to each other in the area office and who makes the tea and, you know, all of this stuff, I mean, big to small. Um, and uh, we were kind of astounded when they were reporting that, well, you know, this, these, some of these men, you know, who came to the, the, you know, who are part of this process, well, they said to us, well, yeah, now I pay more attention to what my, my wife is doing in the house and I help, you know? Um, so I think it's, it's somewhat arbitrary, uh, it's somewhat serendipitous, you know, that someone takes it to heart, uh, someone recognizes it and does something about it. Um, I think there are also organizations now more and more. Like in India, there's something, about, there's something called MASWA, which is an all Indian organization. It's men, okay. I, it's men working on addressing gender equality in general. That's not the actual acronym, maybe one of you know. Uh, but MESWA works with men on changing uh, gender norms. So, you know, those men work in small towns, small districts. They're ridiculed uh, because they do this work. Um, they do ho housework. Uh, and that's a big part of the, the resistance to change or the difficulty in sustaining the change is because the the social norm, you know, in it goes so much against that social norm that you're ridiculed um, to, you know, to the extent that you're really, you know, laughed out of the, the, the village or town. There was a uh, just interesting, uh, different example, of course, but interesting, different context. Uh, there, I was talking to um, Ricky Wilchens, who is in the United States, works in the United States with boys on changing gender norms, working with young boys. And um, <clears throat> they report that, I mean, and ma many of these young boys, and they're, they're you know, low-income, African-American, white boys, black boys, you know, it, they report that, you know, the, the hardest thing about, precisely the hardest thing about adopting a different kind of behavior is that, you know, I'll be called a pussy, you know, a worse, a this, a that. You know, I mean, it, the, the social pressure on you to maintain those norms, those rigid norms of masculinity, are like a straitjacket. So, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, it, you know, it, it's a very difficult thing to change. Of course, I think that it's also a, an area which is amenable to policy uh, action. Um, you know, so in, in countries where uh, say the social welfare state provides um, good quality uh, childcare arrangements. Um, uh, where would that be? <laughs> um, maybe some of the Scandinavian countries, but even there, I mean, even in Norway, for example, I keep bringing up Norway because my husband is Norwegian. So Priya is half Norwegian, so I, I know a little bit about Norway. So, I mean, even there, there's, a, there's not enough subsidized childcare being provided. Um, it's not enough to meet the demand. So that, that's one of the things um, that could certainly, you know, relieve that work burden. Um, so, they, so some of these things are, you know, are amenable to policy. It's not just, oh, we have to wait for another generation. Um, but most countries, I think, have not certainly, I mean, you look at the United States, the sort of the you know biggest power in the world, and and uh, these provisions, none of these provisions are there. It's not even past the 
what was it? The women's what was the Women's Equality Act in or ERA? E e e equal Rights Amendment. Equal Rights Amendment never passed in the United States. So, any other questions? <coughs> yeah. Um, firstly, thank you for your lecture, and I hope you're well. Um, <laughs> earlier in your lecture, you were talking about the Millennium Development Goals. So, with the Millennium Development Goals due to expire next year, I think with most of them, apart from like information technology, they're not due to meet their targets. Um, with respect to gender empowerment, gender equality, what do you think are the biggest uh, barriers or constraints to achieving the targets? And do you think that the NDGs are perhaps too restrictive in their targets or too ambitious for what they're trying to achieve given institutional and structural rigidities that exist? Okay, we'll take just one more if there's anybody else. Yeah? Uh, you, you almost gave an example about um, contra <laughs> contraception and you, you said enough to go down with it. Um, I was I'm in, sorry? In, you, you almost you gave an example of contraception. Contraception at some point and access to reproductive rights. I, guess. <laughs> yeah. and I think reproductive rights, to me, is, is, is it, yeah, this, this fits exactly what happens because there's so much change that needs to happen at the women's and men's consciousness level, yet I feel that the whole game, to use a sort of football idea, is played in, in that side and this side of the court, which is informal cultural norms plus formal laws, policies, and whoever has more power to influence those, those two arenas seem to keep the ball on the top. This and that. That, exactly. The systemic. Yeah, so on the systemic side. Um, how would you go about it? I mean, what do you think is the way to actually try to pass the ball on the other side? <laughs> so you think most of it happens on this set. I'd like to ask you, how do you think? <laughs> how do you think? Okay, well, yeah, my, 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 my thesis, my PhD thesis, <laughs> which um, is about to submit. And I, what I, what I, what I sort of saw is that you do need to have someone in the systemic side with strong power who kickstarts the change and does not shy away from both creating policies towards women's access and at the same time challenge openly and offensively the norms. Um, that produces a huge reaction. You'd have to be ready for that. Um, and that sort of public opinion debate is what eventually is my opinion. And this is where feminists probably play a bigger role. Come to change, to, to, to give you know, an impulse to women's and men's consciousness change. Mm -hmm. but that, that, that's my impression. And it's very hard. Do you have an example yeah, to show that? Chile, actually, on the, the next the morning after pill in Chile. Okay. Uh, with Michelle Bachelet. Who yes. Did, who did do that? Uh huh. She confronted openly um, by changing um, the policies. Yeah. And eventually a law. She created, passed the law. Mm -hmm. But she passed the law because that was the only way actually to to to, to, to defend reproductive rights in front of such conservative backlash. Mm. Um, now I heard, and it's a rumor, that she's, she's ready after this to try to now pass a law on sexual reproductive rights in Parliament. Mm -hmm. That would be the aim and the, well, I don't know if they're going to go for it, but it, this is a promise she made to the feminist movement. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need that sort of femocrat, mm -hmm. top, in this case, mm -hmm. top femocrat, mm -hmm. to, be, to be there. Yep. Because it seems to me that it's impossible that you <coughs> come from another area, the change can come from another area. Such a sensitive issue. So. Okay. Yeah, yes. Just one more and then okay. they will. Yes. So, quick one thing. I'm Amanda, I actually worked at Awood and followed your work and have been thinking over the years. But um, I just was thinking about, given your experience, experience of gender at work, um, as we're looking forward to the Beijing Plus 20 review, where we're going to go next and what are kind of some, some highlights that you could maybe think of for, um, for this kind of framework, for implementation gap. If I could say a bit about okay. how this can be used in the Beijing plus review, plus yeah. 20 review. Yeah, or just not necessarily to, to, to do this at the review, but what kinds of agendas um, do you think we need to set in terms of the implementation gap and, and that kind of thing? Um, okay, so let it's me... It's a little small question, by the way. I know. Our time is nearly up. Uh, uh, yeah. So, Adrian, I'm well, thank you. Nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
MDGs, probably Nyla is, is a better person to, to respond to, knows a lot more about it than I do, and I hope Nyla will say something. Um, the, you know, if you, again, looking at the gender equality goal, um, the MDGs are, as you know, are, are sort of a, like a, a micro, a sort of, you know, light, right, MDG light. Uh, compared to the, the larger goals, actually, the, the Millennium Declaration. Um, and the indicators for gender equality are very much you know, indicators for this side, right? But even those, right, uh, we haven't done very well. We haven't uh, reached the targets. Now, <clears throat> there, um, there is, of course, a lot of debate right now about what is going to happen post-2015. You know, uh, and there is a move, there's a strong move, I think, to advocate for both a standalone goal and gen gender main and gender equality being mainstreamed into all the goals and indicators for that. And uh, UN Women has a position paper on this, which is on their website. Um, and it's interesting that the paper uh, <clears throat> talks a lot about the the, com the, the issue that Nyla pointed out earlier, which is the, the relatedness of these spheres. You know, we tend to work with them in silos. Um, and, and the relatedness is very important. And the, the second thing that is, that is also very important, which the, the position paper does talk about, is, um, is how these institutions, although I think the, the paper doesn't you know, directly call them institutions, but it talks about how these social norms and institutions really infuse these prob problem areas and are, um, are, are sort of holding back progress. So one of the issues where it, it, which it highlights is violence against women. And violence against women, you know, really sort of smack dab is, is is one of those very sticky areas which has been very difficult to change. And, and says that, you know, the paper says that <clears throat> that should be a big focus, that violence against women, which is currently, you know, not an indicator that we measure, right? We don't look at violence against women when in the MDGs, that that should be one of them. So I think that there is, and I agree with that focus, that there is, one, it's very important to look at the complementarity of these issues and not isolate them to look not only at the sort of the, the, the you know, the, the measurable, you know, tangible kind of uh, uh, outputs and, and indicators, but also look at, uh, you know, changing some of these <clears throat> very uh, sticky issues, because um, violence affects everything. Violence affects health, employment, everything, you know. It's, it's uh, not only is it is a, is a human right to be free from violence in and of itself, but it has you know, spillover effects and everything, but also um, to find ways to, in fact, track, you know, how well we're doing on those things, which we don't do very well. Or at least there's a whole big debate about, and actually now it's coming to the fore. I, I wanted to mention this, and it's a good opportunity. There's something called um, the Big Push Forward. There's a website for it, and um, Roz Iben and Ihen, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, um, in, in, in the Netherlands have started this initiative and it's about challenging the, the sort of the log frame mentality, the um, you know, sort of the way of measuring results. It traces it back really interestingly to you know, how these results have come from sort of the medical field, you know, for example, uh, where or, you know, technical fields and have been imposed onto the slippery fish of development interventions, you know, um, and it, it's they have a website. You can download their papers. Big push forward. I would would strongly recommend that. And of course, um, I think the the realization now. I think more and more people are talking about social norms. The World Bank produced a <clears throat> a report on social norms just last year, and I understand. The only that problem to do more. with the World Bank is, as usual, <clears throat> sure, when it gets hold of a you know a very interesting idea turns it into a variable. Yeah. So it's become a measurable variable, you know, rather than something that diffuses and you know, sort of <coughs> informs the way that you think. So yeah. sort of, it, 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 it can't be measured 
you know, the bank finds it hard to deal with it. Yeah. But they're talking about it. They're talking about it, yes. Which is not bad. <laughs> Amanda, we can talk further, but, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's very interesting uh, to me that the, um, the framework is now used by funders. So Mama Cash, the Global Fund for Women, um, and uh, of course, AWID used it, Sri Lata, in, in, in AWID's analysis of the MDG3 grantees used it. Um, to look, but the funders are using it also to look at their portfolios and what it is they're funding. And I was just told by um, the woman from Mama Cash that they're going to be present, presenting this to um, the Conference of uh, Human Rights Funders, which is happening in San Francisco. So, so uh, again, they're using it you know, to look at where is the bulk of their portfolio going, um, and what does that say about how they think change happens? What is their theory of change? And what are they missing? And what is it, and sort of also uh, I suggested that they should use it sort of in a reflexive way to ask themselves, what is it about what we are, what we're standing for, um, what are our values if in fact the bulk of our portfolio is here, here, and here. So, I mean, I think now this framework is being used by all the Oxfams. Um, it's being used by a lot of organizations and increasingly by, for monitoring and evaluation. So it certainly can be helpful, um, you know, for the purposes that you describe. And, you know, we can, we can talk more about that, um, you know, whenever if you're interested in doing that. So, hey, I think we've come to the end. Uh, thank you very much, Aruna. I think that was extraordinarily useful and interesting. And uh, I think laid out the challenge, but made the challenge seem not insurmountable, <laughs> which I think is a great thing to do. Um, one other point, when you were talking about spirits and uh, something else, I think, you know, thinking of the challenge as not being insurmountable gives you the energy to tackle the challenge. I think if you think of a challenge as sort of, you know, just so impossible that it can't be moved, you may as well just go home and die. Or like <laughs> you lose the will to live, you know. So I think seeing this kind of change, um, you know, it's, it's very important. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.